there are a lot of misconceptions about what a comic book colorist does. And this causes issues for people that are just starting to learn how to color. And I see a lot of coloring samples from my students, and there are some common issues that seem to be almost universal. So in this video, I want to run you guys through the top five rookie comic book colorist problems. All right, welcome everyone. My name is K. Michael Russell. I am a comic book colorist. I've worked on about 80 books, mostly for Image and Top Cow. I'm also the instructor at O1ArtSchool.com. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So, the top five most common problems for beginner colorists. Now, some of you guys watching this video, especially if you're new to the channel, you're thinking, well, I, I know coloring. It's not that hard. You stay in the lines, you add some light and shadow, boom, you're done, right? I think this scene from the IT crowd is a great analogy for this. So to set this up, Jen here doesn't really understand computers, but she said she did on her resume, and now she's in an interview explaining her computer skills. I have a lot of experience with the whole computer thing, you know, emails. Sending emails, uh, receiving emails, <laughs> deleting emails. Um, I could go on. Do. The web. Using mouse, mices, using mice. Um, clicking, double clicking. Um, the computer screen, of course, the keyboard, the bit that goes on the floor down there. The hard drive. Correct. Uh -huh. Well, you certainly seem to know your stuff. <laughs> So, I love that show. You can understand the basic concepts of the technicalities of adding color to line art, but that doesn't mean you actually understand color for comics. So I hope to clarify this in this video. Let's get started with the number five rookie colorist problem. You don't understand the importance of value and contrast. The reader's eye will tend to gravitate toward areas of higher contrast. This likely stems from the days when we were running around grasslands trying to avoid lions millions of years ago. It was really important that humans were able to distinguish very quickly between what might be a patch of grass and a lion that's waiting to eat you. So this is something that colorists can use to our advantage. We can exploit this. If your values are clearly defined and more contrast is focused on the most important areas of the page, those panels are going to be clearer to the reader. Because you could have a panel with a lot of information like this one, and if I didn't consider where I want the reader's eye to focus first, this could be a problem as their eye bounces around the panel trying to find somewhere to land. And even when I say contrast, some assume that just means contrast of value, you know, light and darker areas. But contrast works in a lot of different ways. You could have contrast with saturation. You could have contrast with the hues that you're using. Even shapes can create contrast. So you can combine all of these to work together, and the effect is even stronger, sort of, sort of like Voltron. And of course, a good penciler is going to be considering these things too, and it's part of their job description also, but we can help clarify the art and push it even further. Number four, you aren't creating depth and atmosphere. Now, I've sort of lumped these together here, but you can look at this a few different ways. Depth can mean separating your planes, foreground, middle ground, background. Notice how I can redirect your focus in this panel just by changing the way these different areas are colored. Here, these people up close seem to be more important, but in this one, this guy in the background is the focus. I found there are a lot of parallels between filmmaking and comics here. This is easier to do in movies and TV because they can literally adjust the focus. We don't have that luxury in comics, so we have to find different ways of making that work. For example, darker and cooler areas tend to recede on the page. You'll sort of look past them. And brighter, warmer areas tend to sort of grab your attention. The other way a colorist can create depth is with something called atmospheric perspective or air perspective. On planets with an atmosphere, we'll use Earth as an example since it seems to be a pretty popular place, the air around us is full of little particles, and the more distance between us and the objects we see in the distance, the more particles there are. So this means the further away something is, it tends to have less contrast and shift a little bit toward blue in, in the daytime. You can see this really clearly if you look at pictures of mountains. It's pretty obvious there, so that's another way you can create depth in your work. Number three, rendering everything to the same level of detail. This is a big one. I see this all the time. This is really another contrast issue. If everything is detailed, it's sort of like nothing is, because you don't have areas of low detail to contrast with the areas of high detail. Focus your rendering on the areas that matter most, and use less detail in the areas that are less important. 
Now this doesn't mean be lazy and don't render backgrounds, but spend more time in the areas you want the reader to focus on, just like literal focus in movies and TV shows. Number two, bad location and scene transitions. I have another movie example for this one. Filmmakers have a lot of tools at their disposal that we just don't have in comics. If they want to shift to a different place or a different time, they can do transitions, they can change the music, but often they will also use color, so it's clear to the viewer when the action moves from one place to the next. The Matrix is a really obvious example of this. So, spoiler alert, the Matrix jumps back and forth throughout the series between the real world and the dream world of the Matrix. And you can see that here. The real world is blue, the Matrix is green. This is a great sort of visual shorthand to indicate to the viewer where we are in a given scene. Think about how much more difficult it would be to follow that movie if every scene was the same color. Where are we? It would make for a very confusing movie. And of course, you don't necessarily have to wash your scenes in one strong color, but just shifting the color schemes, shift the lighting colors, that's really all it takes to indicate these scene changes to the reader. And that brings us to number one on this list. And if you learned something so far and you want even more of these tips, there's a link to a free PDF in the description. It's my coloring pro tips. Some of it will look familiar if you reach this point in the video. But anyway, the number one rookie colorist problem is you are not a storyteller. And this is really the result of combining everything we've talked about. It's the colorist's job, along with the rest of the team, to help tell the story. And if you're doing your job well, the colors are a seamless part of that. If you're a colorist doing your job poorly, best case scenario, you aren't contributing anything other than making black and white pages color. Worst case scenario, you're actually making the book harder to follow, and you're taking away from the experience. You're fighting the line art. That's not what you want. The concepts I've talked about here are some of the most important and most critical parts of being a good comic book colorist and a good storyteller. If you want your portfolio to stand out from the thousands of others that want the same job as you do, start doing these things. Use contrast as a weapon in your storytelling arsenal. Create depth, atmosphere, separate your locations and scenes separate your planes. If you do all of that successfully, you are much more likely to grab an editor's attention because if they're seeing the same portfolios that I'm seeing, and they probably are, they are quickly dismissing a lot of them at a glance. Can I read this page quickly? No. Move on to the next guy. You don't want to be that guy whose pages barely get a second look. So don't take it personally if you're guilty of any of these mistakes. I can assure you, you are not alone. And I was guilty of every single one of these at some point myself. I will link my playlist in the description, How Not to Color Comics, where I go into a bit more detail on some of this stuff. And honestly, there aren't a lot of resources that talk about storytelling with color. You can find a million coloring tutorials on YouTube, and 99.9% .9 of them don't even discuss this. Now, my subscribers and my students here, they'll tell you we talk about storytelling all the time. I try to show you guys as much of my thought process as possible here. So my goal with this channel is really showing you how to think as a colorist. So I hope you'll subscribe. There's a lot of content here, and I'll link a good video to start with on the screen at the end if you are new here. I also have a free beginner lesson with the PSD file in the description. You'll also find a coupon code there for my coloring courses. There are 20 hours of lessons on the whole process start to finish. There's discussion boards for feedback, for questions, sample pages to color, color profiles for Photoshop. So there's plenty of cool stuff to check out in the description. Thank you so much for watching. This is actually the first video I've made going full time here on YouTube, which is a little scary as a as a 40 year old. But but thank you so much for your support, whether it's in my courses or Patreon or just retweeting and sharing my videos and watching them here. So keep telling your friends. I know a lot of you guys do. Share this video on whatever cool social media platform exists on the day you're watching this. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.